one. Hello and welcome everybody to yet another hour in the 24-hour TWL podcast, uh, raising money for Engineers Without Borders. We are currently at $3,001, uh, which is wonderful for everybody. Everybody gets a round of applause. Woo! Uh, just because we've reached 3000 does not mean that we need to stop. The more the merrier, as they say. Uh, this hour, I am I am joined by uh, two people that I have been very much looking forward to talk to. Uh, first is uh, Julian Beghini. Um, definitely... Definitely a very prominent philosopher, as far as I'm concerned. Um, lots of very great works. Uh, some, some of my favorites include uh, What Philosophers Think, um, as well as The Ego Trick, What Does It Mean to Be You. Uh, all these things can be found online. Uh, if, I, can also recommend, uh, I can also recommend Do They Think You're Stupid and The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten. Oh yes, The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten is... The two copies thing. of your books that I have, Dr. Genie. <laughs> Thank you. So you got a couple fans. Yeah. You got a couple fans on the panel. <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much. And the other one that I have with me right now is uh, Philosophy Two. Uh, also, on, he's on YouTube. He's available for everybody to take a look at. There is a link down below in the stream if you want to check out his channel and figure out oh. what it is he's all about. Thank you very much. You can call me Ollie, by the way, please. Ah, uh, Ollie, perfect. Um, so. I suppose um, we should probably get started. Lundy, just want to quickly interrupt, and we want to give a big thank you to Ollie, especially because he came in, like just uh, basically 24 hours ago. I, I no, it was 48, so I'm losing track of times. But thank you very much. It was <laughs> My basically pleasure. My um, pleasure to be here. Thank yeah, you. It was basically Friday I left work. We had a gap in the schedule. I emailed Ollie. He replied within an hour. So a big thank you to him for stepping in. At the last. No, Just had to say that. So. It's my pleasure. I'm very right. flattered he thought of me, actually. Yep. All right, I'll disappear now. <laughs> Knowing Zulu, he just typed in philosophy into YouTube and it's just like, Big Lundy, do you know who this person is? Yes, I know who it is. Somebody who's awesome. It's like, okay, we'll put him oh, on. Oh, thank you. Very, much. That's very kind. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I suppose we should probably get started. Um, both of you have done uh, a variety of different topics as far as um, I, I suppose we could call it public communication uh, of philosophy in general. Um, one, of the, one of the big things that I usually get into as far as engaging with the public and philosophy is an extreme level of apathy. Um, I, th I think Dan Dennett said it best when he said, I'm a philosophy professor. What that means is when I go to parties and I tell people what I am, uh, they go, uh oh. <laughs> 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 so uh, it, there's just, there's just seems to be this uh, complete apathy of uh, philosophy, philosophers, uh, people who just don't see, don't seem to see the point. I suppose, and I'd like to when get people even know what it is at all. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's several times that. I go, I study philosophy, and then ten minutes later they go, so tell me about psychology, and I'm like, I've got no idea what psychology is, never studied it. Just because I'm a philosopher doesn't mean that I know a lot about these other things. Uh... <laughs> no, they think it's the same thing. It's like they don't, they just don't get it. They have no idea. So I was wondering yeah, if I think that's true. Give, the, give a bit of a statement as to why it is that you feel that philosophy is important for your general your general public to at least be semi-informed about. Uh, hmm. we'll start, we'll just to have a little structure here. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Ollie, and uh, then we'll go with Julian. Oh, gosh. Um, why do I think philosophy is important for the, the general public? Well, I guess it does school you in having an analytic mind. It is useful in that regard. Um, it's always good to analyze the ideas that you're given and that you see and that get fed into your life, I suppose. That's, that's very useful. I find it useful because it's a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoy doing the conceptual exploration that comes with it. But I suppose, in a soundbite, generally thinking deeply and critically about things, and about all things in particular, because there aren't really any taboo subjects in philosophy. You can do philosophy about anything. Um, so thinking deeply about certainly things that a lot of people take for granted or people think are sacrosanct, not necessarily religiously sacrosanct, but in the kind of untouchable assumptions that aren't to be questioned. And thinking critically about those things, I suppose, can be very useful. And also it would be personally nice for me if people were philosophically literate so that people wouldn't confuse it with psychology when I talk to them about other parties, I guess. <laughs> Definitely good. Uh, Julian? Well, you know, suddenly this uh, seemingly long hour seems very short because <laughs> there's so much to say about this already. I mean, first of all, the earlier point about the lack of interest, I think that's changed, actually. And I think even the misunderstanding has changed a bit as well. Because, I mean, like Ollie, I mean, I remember when I first started doing philosophy and I said I was, you know, studying philosophy at university, people said, oh, so you're going to psychoanalyze me then? You know, get that, that same confusion, not knowing 
what it was. I think things really have changed a bit. There's a lot more public philosophy going on now. And so I think from that point of view, more people have a better idea. But why it's important? Well, I don't want to introduce disagreement just for the sake of it, but I actually do think there are concerns. It's very easy to point to what seems to be obviously and indisputably good about philosophy. So yes, thinking more for yourself, thinking more rigorously, thinking more analytically. I mean, who could be against these things? But it's kind of like it's it's not something that is automatically and necessarily a benefit because I think it really matters that you do it in the right spirit. And that's not something you automatically get from finding out more about it. And I mean, just why I think that's so important is that I have come across, I think, quite a lot of people who, who know uh, anything between a little bit about philosophy right to a lot. This, this, this is not a criticism of people who are not professionals. The same thing happens with sometimes people who are really, you know, top of their game uh, from a career point of view, which is that what philosophy has really done for them is that it's given them the tools to be able to uh, rationalise and justify essentially what are their, their prejudices and, and bedrock intuitions. Mm. And so I think that all these tools of philosophy, which are wonderful, all these wonderful things are only really going to be of benefit if you bring the right spirit to them, which is that genuine, open-minded and self-questioning um, mentality. It's a self-questioning. A lot of people use it as a tool basically to question everything else. They become smart asses who like love to look at whatever the latest op-ed piece in the paper is or whatever the latest thing and go, oh, well, this is nonsense, of course. As a philosopher, we know that's a fallacy, etc., etc." Hmm, That's an interesting, that's an interesting point, actually. I hadn't considered it like that, that you need to be able to that it gives you the tools, but you need to be able to use it in the right way. You know, you need to be able to stay away from the dark side of the force and not not use philosophy yeah. selfishly. Well, yes, and yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, that's generally uh, uh, the problem that I find when trying to communicate online, for instance, like YouTube. Uh, oh, you might be familiar with this little problem. Uh, some people, like everyone on YouTube, seems to be very much uh, knowledgeable as to what, for instance, the logical fallacies are. They don't mm. seem to be very knowledgeable as to when they're supposed to be applied to an argument, when, when someone is supposed to uh, uh, point it out. Uh, it's, they're not very good at actually analyzing an argument to figure out if it's actually being used. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's also the problem where even, even if I'll, for instance, source what I'm saying, if, I, if I'll source books if I'll, or if I'll source uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, something along those lines to try and help people get a better understanding, if they just read it on their own, they don't have if they're reading it going into it with an agenda then there's going to be a misunderstanding as to mm -hmm. what they're going to be reading uh for instance yeah, certainly people going into going into things and not necessarily being open about it not having that that um philosophical spirit as you said dr Bajini, can can be a problem i've noticed that sometimes um people do have an eye particularly when they watch my videos some people not many um do have the ideas that they have and aren't really interested in those being challenged and I might address something in the video and, and talk about it and then they'll say, what about this? And, and I don't want to be rude and say, you know, I, I literally just said that. I just talked about it. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're right. Sometimes people do, yeah, I guess, use the use the dark side of philosophy to continue this metaphor that we're <laughs> developing to back up <laughs> Well, I think, I think one of the problem is, of course, philosophy doesn't require any, or it's not supposed to, uh, require any specialist factual empirical knowledge. I mean, it doesn't work in a completely em em empirical vacuum, but the kind of knowledge of the world you're supposed to need to do philosophy, according to standard accounts, is just the kind which is available to everyone. But I think, again, sometimes that trips people up. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of this, right? This is, again, a, a professional philosopher many years ago. Um, there was this story you may well remember you may have even talked about it uh about the mmrr vaccines so this is a combined mumps um, rubella, uh, yeah. measles and rubella a vaccine and there was a scare about it basically being linked to autism and it was based on a report by you know published in a journal but it was very extremely disputed and uh over time it was formally it retracted was, i think it was one of the yeah, it was one of the well, big formal retractions is, the lancet issued 
Here's the point. Well, here, when it got to the point where it was retracted, the editor of the Lancet, which I believe was the medical journal that published it, said that had he known, they're talking about the funding of this study, because the study had been funded by a lot of people, partially or in or in full, I'm not sure, who were basically a sceptics group about uh, the, the MMR right, vaccine. So the yeah. people funding the study had an agenda and uh, they published it. And the editor of the journal said that had he known about this funding, he wouldn't have published the paper in the first place. Now, that seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, Pops this philosopher who goes, ah, well, you know, there is such, this is an example of the uh, the genetic fallacy, you know, which is the, the origins of an argument is not, it, it should not be the judge of its validity. So, you know, typically speaking, uh, if, if if a person uh, making an argument is a, is a Nazi or member of the, yeah, the, the National Socialist Party, then actually that's irrelevant to judging the merits of the argument. The argument has to be judged on its own account. Now, this is all very well, but this is a kind of a very crude application of that rule, which is very naive about very important things you need to know about the workings of the real world. Now, in science, we just know very well that experimental bias is a very real problem. And the reason why you actually have to be very scrupulous about knowing who's funding uh, a study and, and where it's coming from is because it has the capacity to interfere with the empirical results. So it's just a it's just a scientifically naive thing to turn around and say, well, it doesn't matter where the funding comes from because arguments must stand up according to their own um, credibility. It's, just, it's, it's, it's taking a standard which would, would work very well if you're merely looking at a logical argument, but it doesn't work at all when you're looking about it in empirical scientific studies where, again, we know that experimental bias can affect outcomes. Mm. Well, yeah, I think it's, it sounds like that um, that particular philosopher perhaps didn't pick his fight or pick their or her, <laughs> of course, um, pick their moment uh, especially well, because whilst Absolutely. it might have been a nice might of thing, oh, I'll teach everybody about the genetic fallacy and, and so on, in in the real world, um, even though the fact that it was funded by those groups doesn't absolutely deductively establish it as being bad, yes. it's obviously a very good indicator. So yes, I I agree with you there. Absolutely. Sorry, is there a problem with the? <laughs> oh, sorry. I... Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, technology. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Um, so, so we're all pretty much in a uh, that there does seem to be an issue, of at least some people, when they go into the researching of any one topic, uh, with sort of their own conclusions in mind or their own agenda in mind, it always, it always sort of colors their studies in a way that's not exactly helpful to understanding the world, uh, in any sort of objective manner as kind of weird as that term sounds um at least in that context um so I, I guess i guess the question is then would would it be preferable to and this is kind of my thought on this uh to try and diminish that as much as possible um would it be preferable to limit people's ability to uh, gain this information to do this research unless it's under some sort of formal grounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, at, at the very least, somebody has to direct them to this stuff and help them understand it rather than anybody can just go out and find out, find whatever they want. Uh, would that be mm -hmm. uh, perhaps an idea mm -hmm. as far as um, trying to limit this happening? Well, I, I, I suppose that's absolutely 100% directly relevant to, to what I do, which is trying to distribute... Um, philosophical knowledge to people freely and, and easily I hadn't thought that maybe they'd be using it for evil um, that's an interesting <laughs> question um, I suppose I suppose maybe one of the things you'd have to consider is what are the odds that they'd use it in a good way and what are the odds that they'd use it in a bad way and you might have to do some kind of weighing up of the likely outcomes of that but um, I certainly probably wouldn't be comfortable with making philosophy some kind of elite club that only people who have studied for a long time and have a lot of money, especially in our country um, and, in, and in America as well, have access to. Um, so I probably wouldn't be entirely comfortable with restricting people's access to philosophy until they've proved it, because they've proved that, they've, um, that they can wield it responsibly, because of course making mistakes and using it badly would be how you learn 
to improve. So um, I'm not even sure how you would stop people doing philosophy. How could you restrict people's access to it? Just not not have YouTube channels like mine and, and not have Dr. Genie well, write its lovely books? And... Well, it, it's less that, because the way that you're doing it is, is in an educational form. You're not just saying, here is this concept and that's it. You're, you're also explaining it uh, to a decent degree. So the, the, obviously we're not going to be able to eliminate, uh, e even in the context of the, of the possible fixing of the problem, as, as, I, as I put forward, we're not going to be able to eliminate entirely uh, somebody who's still going into this research with their own biases in mind. Uh, the, the, the thing is that sometimes, uh, I, at least in my experience, uh, somebody might be going in with their own biases, but they don't know that they're going in with their own biases. So they're just reading what they already thought into whatever subject they're actually think they're actually looking into. I'm less, I'm less interested in making it an elite club and more interested in saying that, um, Information should always be uh, done in a supplemental way. Uh, it, it shouldn't, it, it, in my opinion, it's 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 more harmful in the public view, uh, less the academic view, but but in the public view, if it's just factual information just kind of thrown at them, that they can just form whatever conclusion they want about without any sort of uh, actual education on the matter. Um, mm. So you know, public speaking, YouTube videos. Uh, uh, public books being being written on the subject, all that to me is fine. Uh, it's more it's more so when uh, more technical stuff is is introduced to the public, and uh, without a proper understanding of what they're what they're reading about, the, they can sometimes come away thinking very strange things. Actually, I believe there was a very good example of that um, a while ago. Linking back to what we were saying about vaccination, um, they. I think distributed a lot of information showing that um, vaccination did not have a link to um, autism. And then shortly after distributing that information, put around a survey saying, you know, what do you think of vaccination? And apparently it actually negatively impacted people's views. Yeah. So people can be quite resistant to information if you just give it to them and say, look, here are here's a list of facts. And um, so that would be a good example of what you were talking about. That, that's quite interesting. But by, by the way, we are on first name terms here. By the way, Ollie's very nicely calling me Doctor Pagini, but I, I, the only person who calls me Doctor Pagini is, is my is my mother when she writes to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, let, let's stick to that. Um, now, um, yeah, that's such a pretty good example, actually, Ollie, because um, it's actually well known that this myth busting uh, doesn't work. Again, this is one thing I find very, very interesting. Um, I think it's very important is the way in which I do think, although people confuse philosophy and psychology, in a way, philosophers could do with confusion using the two a bit more uh, in a more deliberate way. I think that sometimes it's psychological naivety which gets in the way. So uh, there's a lot of research which shows that yeah, myth busting <coughs> doesn't work. So a leaflet like that doesn't work. And why doesn't it? Because actually the way in which people form associations and beliefs is more by just mere exposure than it is by the details of the argument. So every time you put before someone the idea that there is a link between these two things, even if you're actually putting that information there to deny it, it's uh -huh. giving positive reinforcement to it. It's, it's a no smoke without fire kind of effect. Uh -huh. So myth busting so the fact is that you're very... even talking about it, people people go, oh, well, why, if it's not a thing, yeah, why is it? Well, it must be, yeah. Kind of like that, yeah, not even consciously, but like things around sort yeah. of, you know, immigration. So, so myth busting, again, and a lot of people who campaign on issues like, you know, asylum issues and refugee issues, they've kind of learned this the hard way. For years they went around thinking people are being misinformed by the tabloid press and, and hysterical campaign groups. If only they were to see the, the facts before them, they would uh, realise the error of their ways. In fact, it's it's just what happened with the vaccine thing. It's taken to reinforce the fact there is something there real that's being talked about rather than just getting rid of it. But, but the broader point about access, I mean, I really don't think you, 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 it's, it's, you, you just can't police the access in those ways, informally or informally, because actually, you know, I mean, it, it, it's putting too much trust in expertise. Um, you know, so on the one hand, I, I certainly do have a lot of respect for people who have in any discipline who have really been doing it for, for decades and, and, and know the literature inside out. And of course, I think those people 
in important senses, on average, have a, a much greater understanding than the lay person. But we also know that you know acculturation and uh, can lead people into kind of you know established ways of doing things which are sort of wrong or misguided or, or blind alleys. And so, if you get those people in any way kind of policing what's meant to be sort of proper and good in that discipline to too too far and extreme, you're going to cut down on innovation. I think the real problem issue here really is it's more of a broader cultural one i mean this is going to sound to some people that's horribly kind of undemocratic and elitist in another way but i think there's a real problem in that we the culture we have now is is the kind of everyone's entitled to their opinion kind of thing anyone can become a a blogger or a publisher or something and this is and this is not something i'm being critical of i started the philosopher's magazine from scratch so i'm a self a self-made self-started publisher and a philosopher as well so in no way can i be against people just doing it but it so this is culture anyone can do it everyone has a right to do it even on news programs and discussion programs it's always you know tweet let us know what you think send us emails now this is good up to a point but the point is that people need to appreciate the fact that merely having an opinion isn't good enough you know you've got to be able to sort of give good grounds for it and to justify it and it's then the test is i'm entitled to my opinion with i'm entitled to not have my opinion challenged (laughs) Yes, exactly. You're entitled to your opinion means you're also entitled to believe complete nonsense. You know, you're entitled to it, but it doesn't make it not nonsense. And the question of whether it's nonsense or not isn't settled by the person's CV. So this is why it's not actually, it's not an elitist point in that sense. It's, It's not elitist, but it's not completely egalitarian either. Some opinions and some views are Um, better thought through uh, than others and I think that you know people need to sort of have that you know that challenge needs to to, to be there more strongly and that's the thing to counter this kind of well you know uh, so yes if you want to go through the most technical paper in any kind of discipline in order to give your view as an outsider you'll be perfectly entitled to do that but of course you'll expect you, you yourself to have to do that in a way that is very rigorous and will be subject to scrutiny and if you get things wrong you'll be criticized and people won't say well yeah that's fine great you're entitled to your opinion do you think that philosophy and people being exposed to that with its um practice and insistence on backing things up and and so on might help that problem um do you think people studying philosophy or or maybe reading philosophy books or watching philosophy youtube videos do you think that situation might be helped in a small way by that? Well, well, it goes back to what I was saying in my earlier, my opening sort of comments, really, which is that I think you, they they can, but it's it's really not necessarily. And I'm not I'm not even sure. I must admit, I'm not even sure what I think the tendency is. I mean, I would have thought that on average, a person who does that kind of thing, who, who who sort of has that kind of philosophical knowledge, is going to be more likely than others to have a more thought through and balanced position. And I think that's probably true. But I'm only saying probably. I really don't know for sure, because I, I, I see so many examples of, again, people basically just kind of, you know, taking their, their knowledge and their skills to basically back up what they do. And I see so many people kind of doing philosophy, I think, in the I say the the, the the wrong spirit, which I mean, well, there are many wrong spirits of doing philosophy. One, for example, is I find that people are much too keen to sort of like uh, have a an original position in some way, you know. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing the magazine, I kept getting sent things by people who claim they have a radical new theory. And, you know, there's very little completely radical and new in philosophy. And people seem to be less concerned with getting things right than they are with having their view, which can kind of have their, their authorship on it. I have certainly uh, it's just found another YouTube. Yeah. So, so I think, again, that's another real um, issue there. So, yeah, I, of course it, it will help, but I just, I just think we need to really always stress all the time and stuff that you've got, to, you've got to approach it in the right way. And, you know, my introductory books, I do, I kind of was aware of that. And there's always, I think you'll find somewhere in the, towards the end or at some point where I'll be kind of saying, listen, you know, it's not just about, you know, reading this and internalizing it, taking my word for it. It's actually about, you know, are you going to, are you going to think about things in, in, in the appropriately self, self-critical spirit? I think the self-critical thing is, actually probably the key to be honest it's that question of like 
checking against yourself because it's very easy i mean i do it too you know you have an idea and you think wow this is great this is fantastic you know um your own ideas always seem absolutely brilliant and, and works of genius and uh, <laughs> uh, when you're in an academic setting you know, whether it's studying or with peers and colleagues you will soon have that view really scrutinized by others and it will, it will force you to check it whereas when you're when you're at home and I, you know, I work from home in isolation. When you're home, it's very easy for you just to run away with it. And without other people making that challenge, you have to be your own best self-critic. Yeah. Hmm. It's, definitely, it's definitely key, I, I think, in, in most um, sort of public communications of, of not, just, not just an idea, but also disagreements um to to for for everyone involved to be as self-critical as possible um i do find that at least in the essence of popular articles there is a bit of a lack of this um whether that be on personal blog sites uh or um youtube or uh forums or anything along those lines um it, it, you, you really do hit the nail on the head when you say that your own ideas always seem like they're brilliant uh, until, until you actually uh, sort of analyze them for yourself. It's, it's, it, it, it might be the best way to, to really look at your own ideas is to just picture, some, the, picture the person that you hate the most in your life, the person you can't stand, making the same argument, saying the same <laughs> Because you will, you will just, like, you are, I want to say you're wrong. So <laughs> it, it, that's, that, that seems to be very helpful. Um, but there is the, there is the issue of people not doing that, and I'm wondering like what would be. It's kind of hard to encourage people to not think of themselves as intelligent. You know what I mean? Like, how do you fix the issue of of someone not being self critical? How do you encourage them to do that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I like the technique, by the way. I think that's actually that, that's a, re, a really good, really idea, good one. Yeah. Imagine somebody you don't like uh, saying it because actually, and, and I think people can can identify with that because yeah, if there's one thing that makes you doubt your own views, it's when you hear someone, um, you know, you really don't like uh, say something uh, spookily like what you agree with. You suddenly think, oh, maybe I'm not so uh, right after all. It's also a good exercise, actually, also in in perhaps some um, sympathy for others. You know, recognizing that sometimes people we we don't like in lots of ways aren't wholly wrong how do you do it I, I, I don't know I mean I just think that I mean it has a long heritage of course I mean this famous and cliched Socrates thing about you know being the wisest man in Athens because he knew he knew nothing um it becomes a bit of a cliche and it can become just another way of uh, just actually boosting your own ego <laughs> um to to think that you know I, but I, I just think that that kind of humility should come just from looking around you and looking at yourself. I mean, I, 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 I do kind of take a, I don't know, it depends on what hour of the day it is, but in some ways I do take a quite a dim, a dim view of humanity. I think it's amazing, actually, what we've managed to achieve as a species, given the fact that, you know, we're, we're so dumb in so many ways. And, and, you know, you look around and you see people and, you know, you see even the people you most admire, there are very few people who are really smart kind of across the board. Everyone has their blind spots. Everyone has their, their weaknesses. Um, you That's know, so some people, yeah, I mean, some people, you know, for some, there have been brilliant thinkers and even great moral thinkers who have made complete pig's ears of their personal <laughs> lives, you know, and in ways which you know, is ethically important. It's not just that they've chosen inappropriately. They've actually like, you know, treated their own families badly because mm. they've become so wrapped up in the big, moral and political issues of the day. I think, yeah, you, if, if you just take an honest look at us, you'd think, look, we're all remarkably flawed. Now, either I am the one unflawed person in the universe who is, like, really a great genius, or I, too, have these flaws. And I think that the most of us, there are probably some people who are really brilliant. There are some really brilliant people who I kind of wouldn't blame them if they had delusions of grandeur. But, you know, for the rest of us, even even if you're doing pretty well in your field, you know, you know that you, you mark yourself up against the greats, you know. Even the greats got things hugely wrong. You could read passages in Descartes and, and Kant and think, how what a what a howler, that's a terrible mistake. Aristotle as well. So, Some of Aristotle's ideas of physics. Aristotle! Like, what? Oh, 
You didn't God, even have yeah, to really was... think of that. You could have just gone outside and checked. Like, that would have been better. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, so I mean, I, I think it should come, but it, it, take, it takes a kind of practice, I think. You know, it takes a kind of... Uh, you know, you have to kind of be in the habit of reminding yourself of this. And I think one difficulty it is, in a sense, it requires you to be emotionally strong. I think people find it difficult because actually, again, and uh, I'm sort of raiding against, I'm kind of like an old fogey here, raiding against the culture. But we do have this great thing about you know self-esteem and self-confidence, which I think can there are good things about that. But I think that in some ways that has discouraged that kind of self-criticism and self-doubt. The point is to accept your own limitations, to accept that in lots of ways you are a dumbass like everyone else, is not to despise yourself or to be uncompassionate to yourself or to think that you're worthless. It's simply to sort of, you know, in a sense it's being being kind to yourself and, and, and not expecting too much. And you strive on just doing better, a little bit better next time. Uh, you know, and I... I, I I think it's a perfectly reasonable attitude, but I think some people find it hard to do because it it it, it can it slides into self loathing, which it shouldn't do. You know, you you shouldn't hate yourself just because you recognise there are huge limits on yourself and you're capable of, of idiocy. I think inviting feedback can be quite helpful with that as well. If you if you have an idea or or a theory or something and you put it out there and say, you know, if, if any if there's any questions or problems with this, let me know because I want it to improve. That's certainly Ooh. something I certainly something i try to do a lot with the channel i mean if, if you the ones you've seen you you might know that i always go through the comments from the previous episode at the at the end of every episode and and talk about the questions and the issues that arise and sometimes people actually really do say things and i'm like wow i never thought of it that way you're you're probably right about that and i do change my mind so yeah inviting feedback i think is good um i suppose also we can see by looking at history that when people put aside their personal biases things do work certainly with the history of, of science i mean um, a lot of people thought that tectonic plate theory was absolute nonsense and then you know when that was eventually when they put aside their biases against it they found out it was actually true so um being aware of your personal biases as a strategy for finding truth has historically been quite successful mm. Um, yeah. just, just to go ahead and, uh, interrupt just for a second. Uh, currently we raise another $10 this hour. Uh, we have another 24 minutes to go. Um, I'm wondering, um, Julian, if you'd be willing to do us a favor, would you be willing to mm -hmm. offer, uh, perhaps an autographed copy of one of your books for a decent sized donation? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. No problem at all. Uh, I'm um, you can, you can pretty much take your pick if you like about which one you want. I think I've got spares of most and then someone's going to pick the one i don't have a spare of aren't they but uh yeah <laughs> or do you want to specify now um you know any any book that uh the donator would like uh if that's an available option i think they probably like that yeah 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 come on yeah if it's as long as i've got a copy i'll, I'll get one i'll get one sent absolutely yeah so let's go ahead and uh say uh for everybody who donates 25 dollars i i think that's mm -hmm. fair uh, they'd get an autographed copy of one of uh, Beginney's books, uh, any it, whichever one uh, that's in his collection that you'd like. Uh, so, if I there's a way of finding out who's actually been donating the money and their names, then I, I can't offer anybody a free autographed copy of of anything important. But I'd certainly be happy to give them a shout out on the show if they wanted that um, as, a, as a supplemental prize. It's not exactly an autographed book, but it's. It's the most I can do. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm making sure. I'm making sure that I'm looking at the chat. So if anybody, if anybody makes a donation and they and they and they want to specify in the chat that they made the donation and for and for what, then uh, I'll be able to see that and I'll be able to let you guys know the details. Uh, What's to stop people um, sorry, saying they've made donations? In sorry, the chat? Um, I was just saying, like when you make your donation, you can put a message in, so you can put oh, the, cool. the title of your book in, and you can you can provide a postal address, and I can pass it on to Julia. Cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh, great. Like, I'll tell you what, though, also got, I've got, I'll tell you what, I've got, I've, got a, I've got a Spanish language edition of the Ego Trick. So if anyone wants a Spanish language edition, there you go. La Trampa del Ego. That was so cool. <laughs> that was just like like Scotty, the, the technical guy, just coming in from, from nowhere. He's been eavesdropping on our conversation the whole time. Just interjecting with the voice of Scottish technological authority. <laughs> Actually, I like how you just called him Scotty. <laughs> yeah, because he just kind of chipped in. It says, I can make it happen, Captain. It's great. <laughs> I actually, um, I, I have, um, do you think you're stupid here, Julian? Which was a uh, given to me as a philosophy prize in school. Um, oh, my, really? 
I came top of my year in philosophy and they gave me a copy of your your book as a reward. I remember reading it. It was good fun. It actually was it inspired me to you know, it played a role in inspiring me to go on and study philosophy. So that is, a, that is a wonderful book to give to somebody as a reward. Why do people think you're stupid? <laughs> do they think you're stupid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, sure, why, they, why they think that? Why That's they think you're stupid? They do think you're stupid. Well. They, they might think you're stupid, but why? I hadn't thought of it. That's possibly a sneaky dig by my headmaster. <laughs> the, so, um, you, you you brought up you brought up just sort of as an off, kind of an offhand joke, uh, uh, some some bit of Star Trek. Um, I, I I actually find that one of the most valuable things uh, as far as uh, the public is concerned with philosophy is that it can always be applied to whatever media uh, we're, we're current, we're, whatever society it is is being exposed yeah. to. Um, Star Trek, in, in my opinion, is definitely one of the, one of the big ones. Um, oh, yeah. Not only is... I mean, I was, I was always more of a next generation than original series, but there's some great great stuff in like especially in next generation was like we must stick to the prime directive and the, the prime directive is very very canty and it's kind of like don't interfere if things go wrong that's not our fault but we, we don't interfere with people so i definitely think you're right and actually um reading philosophy into things is a great great way and i'm trying to do more of this on the channel of teaching people about it to say look here's this thing that you guys all know but did you actually ever realize that that's there's another way of thinking about this and um, have you ever seen the show rick and morty it's oh an yes, I love that show. Yeah, I've got um, a script and an episode upcoming, hopefully next week, which is going to be about the philosophy of Rick and Morty. So it's it's a good one, and um, like plays as well. So yeah, it's it's really good. It's a great tool for get, for helping people to better, not only better understand, but better enjoy. At least in my opinion, uh, whatever media they're 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 experiencing, and because because whenever I want to actually have like a conversation about like the inner philosophy of a show or a movie or anything yeah. like this, somebody will always tell me inevitably, "Oh, it's just a show," or "Oh, it's just a movie. <laughs> you don't have to think about it that much." Well, why not? Why not think about it a little bit more? Absolutely, that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah. I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. But uh, that just when you when you understand the concepts, it's it becomes it also becomes a lot easier to recognize when it's happening because sometimes it's it's subtle. Like you brought up the prime directive with with uh, the next generation in Star Trek. Um, I, I, there's also uh, egalitarianism. And that's a, that's a huge thing in Star Trek. Like the, so many different races working together, there's there's very little thought actually paid to the differences of of, of the of the different species, uh, aside from what it would do to impact a Pratt Princess command or anything like that. And it really does sort of show uh, a bit of an opinion as to what that society would be like. And and essentially, it's it's fairly successful. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's just one thing like there's and each, each individual episode will have its own sort of sort of philosophical message that that you can sink your teeth into it's like every and, and it's not the only one you can look at something as 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 simplistic as like kids cartoons and and definitely find something fairly deep to to analyze in whatever it is um it just it, it just boggles my mind whenever an analysis comes up for a show uh, and other people will complain that the show is being analyzed. Like for some reason, it's taking away the fun for them. To, yeah. To so have, you don't, have first of all, you don't have to listen to the analysis. Like if somebody makes a video saying this is the philosophy of Star Trek, and you're like, "Come on, man, this is the show." You're like, well, well, you don't have to watch that video, and it's not like you're right. It doesn't detract from it. It doesn't stop you watching it. It's people going, "Oh, I don't want to think. I don't want to be challenged. I didn't come here to you know think about <laughs> deeper themes." It's a pain in the butt. In fact, the same is not only true of, um, you know, like TV shows and stuff, but I've I've found um, as a as a stand up comic as well. Um, some of the time, um, I've found that people people really don't like stand up comedy being challenging or intellectual. You know, you'll you'll frame something in a certain way that's supposed to get people to think about a topic, and and a lot of the time it goes over well, and some people are just like, I don't get it. I didn't come here to be challenged. Why is he talking about this? Why is he not talking about how his girlfriend's different from him? I don't get it. I'm uncomfortable by comedy that I don't understand. Like it, people, people aren't interested in in comedy, especially a lot of the time, being intellectually challenging. So, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't detract from the original thing. If somebody says I really like Star Trek and it makes me think, then it doesn't stop you enjoying it. So I don't know what people's problem is with that. 
Uh, yes, you the comedy, the comedy is challenging, isn't it? Because, I mean, obviously people say they like satire, but I think it was um, John Lloyd, the legendary comedy producer, not long, not long got news, also QI more recently. I remember an interview with him in it, which he was saying that satire is actually one of the most conservative forms of comedy going, because actually when people watch satire, what they generally are watching is having their own political beliefs yeah. reinforced, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, look at them, they're a bunch of incompetent fools, oh, look at them, they're venal, greedy, and so forth. And I, I think there's something true, you know, comedy, you know, maybe, maybe comedy just isn't actually the best vehicle to do truly challenging things, because maybe it, you know, it, it makes you feel you know, a little bit uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. There's always going to be that f- f- familiarity there. So mm. I, I think that, yeah, there are issues around that. But in terms of the popular culture stuff, I think, again, it's, it's absolutely fair Enough. there's been a huge explosion of them it's open court started their series years ago now with these books on seinfeld and the simpsons and philosophy and they've done zillions since and, and so have, uh, blackwell have done them there's a heck of a lot out there and i think overall yeah these are good ways in for people the only, the only sort of caveat i have about them is that sometimes i think people uh, mistake uh, the ability to be able to you know draw on something for lots of philosophical analysis to it actually being genuinely philosophically deep itself. And yeah. that, that often isn't yeah. the case. I mean, things like Star Trek actually are, you know, have always been very thoughtful and very deliberately, um, uh, you know, philosophically interesting in, in that way. But some of the things these books are about, you know, in a sense, you, you can philosophize about anything. Um, it doesn't mean you should, of course, but it also means if you do, it doesn't therefore prove that the thing you're philosophizing about is sense. itself really rich. You know, I can philosophize, I can philosophize about hamburger but a hamburger is is not a philosophical thesis. <laughs> so um, one one of, the, one of the commenters, Bob Tibet, said that he wants us to analyze episode one of Monty Python, um, <laughs> which would be fun. Uh, but be, because uh, we only have about fourteen minutes to go, uh, if we got like an, an eighty nine dollar donation and got up to thirty one hundred dollars, uh, that would be probably something we could we could give a shot for. Uh, other than I, that, I, though, I can't remember what happens. I, it's been, it's been, well, it's been, it's been a long time. It would be, it would probably, essentially, be like watching an, a new episode for me at this. Yeah, point, as yeah, long as it's been since I've watched the entirety of Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was in episode one? <laughs> they've just reunited, haven't they? Or oh, they did a, a live show? They're uh, doing some stage show. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because they they need the money. <laughs> <laughs> he needs the money apparently <laughs> extraordinary yeah, expensive yeah. divorce for John Cleese um, yeah I wasn't going to say that but I was so. thinking about it loudly no, no he's, he said it himself you know he, he did his last tour was kind of the alimony tour or something like that it was like, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's not making a secret of it you know he, uh, he's, he's right. got, to, got to pay something off yeah well but the Pythons I mean they, they were very, again very explicitly I mean they're, they're, the philosophical stuff there you don't have to kind of uh, in, invent anything. A, a lot of it really was there. In fact, I've done. I did. I did. I did do a talk once on the philosophy of, of Monty Python, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, I have. A, I have. A, do you want to hear my Python philosophy thesis, as it were? Hey, go, on, go on. Go on. Okay, right. So basically, I mean, yeah, there is a kind of unifying kind of view behind. It. They do lots of skits which are based on specific things, but I think you know, basically, Monty Python represents the kind of the the Anglo-Saxon alternative to to French existentialism. So, in French existentialism, Camus, Sartre, you have this the the meaningless and the pointlessness of the world, and it's a cause of kind of despair and anguish and perhaps defiance. Now, in Python, you get exactly the same kind of sense that you know the, the world is absurd. But but rather than you know the donning the black polar neck and smoking the the you like you just you just laugh at it you deal with it by seeing its absurdity and actually laughing because actually all the the films I think this is true of the films I mean if you think of the films they're all about debunking these grand narratives aren't they Monty Python the Holy Grail and the and the life of Brian and the meaning of life what they're doing in all those things is they're taking these things that historically human beings have told stories about themselves which are these huge self important grand narratives and the Python kind of take on it which is the existentialist one is that this is basically nonsense there is no higher purpose no no higher goal it's all a bunch of self-deluding nonsense and um people are comical when they buy into it and believe themselves to be part of this and once you realize it's nonsense all you do is you you hang on the cross dying uh, whistling and singing a song because you know, <laughs> that's, 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 very explicit at the end of holy grail isn't it where it's it's literally shown to be a bunch of people 
running around <laughs> fields doing nonsense. And it's yes. like it's not King Arthur at all. They're actually just a bunch of nutters, and then they get arrested. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Good way of putting it. Oh, Holy Grail was definitely my favorite thing about Monty Python ever. More than Life of Brian, which a lot of people will disagree with me on that, but I'm sorry. Holy Grail has a special part in my life. Um, so let's see. We got about 10 minutes left uh, in, the, in, in this part of the show. Um, so we brought up comedy a little bit uh, and uh, people sort of aversion to comedy that makes, you, that makes them think. Uh, not, not, not everyone, but obviously there is uh, a proportion of people who do that. Um, it's very frustrating when you're on the stage and you're trying to... You're trying to do something funny that's also challenging. People are like, ah. But see, it, 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 to me, it has to do with the phrasing, I guess. Uh, like, for instance, George Carlin, that's pretty much all he did was say as many controversial things as possible uh, in, like, the span of an hour or two-hour <laughs> show. Um, and that got resounded very well. And it's possible that it might have less to do with the fact that he said something challenging and more the fact that his audiences are simply those who already like a priori agreed with the notions that he was putting forward uh, mm -hmm. uh, rather than they were actually being challenged. Um, but I find that, uh, for instance, we talked about being self-critical. Um, comedy is, the, is, is definitely the best way, in, in my experience, to uh, point out maybe flaws with uh, a manner of thinking uh, or a particular type of philosophical position. Because it's it's lighthearted. It's it's not meant to be something that people get uh, extremely offended by. It's not something to like have a war about. It's it's a comedy routine. It's a joke. Um, but at the same time, it helps it helps them think. So it's still definitely very useful in that aspect. I, and, I don't know. I think a joke a joke jokes can be. You say the kind of critical comedy is is lighthearted, but it can be critical comedy can be absolutely savage. You ever seen Stuart Lee? He's he's pretty much, in my you know, humble opinion, uh, the the master of intellectual critical comedy. Like he he can make you feel like an absolute fool when you watch him, and it's savage. Not because he's saying you know, not because he's railing and saying this is all nonsense or this is all nonsense, but he's very ironic, and he always he always frames what he's doing as a as a parody or a send up or something. Like he does um he does a good send up of uh, UKIP, who are who are a right wing British political party's views on immigration. Um, and he, he presents himself as very much agreeing with it and then just extends it and runs with it to an absolutely ludicrous conclusion where he's, he starts saying, you know, I wish Neolithic man had stayed in Europe and never come to Britain. And, you know, the, the, best, the best Neolithic men should have focused on making Europe a good place to live instead of coming over here with their tools and, like, stealing our jobs and stuff. And he just takes it and runs with it. So I'm not sure that intellectual critical comedy necessarily has to be controversial in the sense of railing and stuff. Um, or necessarily lighthearted. It it can just be, just trying to get people to think about something as well as making them laugh. And and sometimes people are resistant to that, not because they're going, oh, this is very sweary, and I don't don't like that kind of comedy. Just just because they're not used to it, really. I mean, also comedy can be very exclusory. I mean, I can't imagine, for example. I mean, it's sort of the old, a lot of the old school comedy, you know, did depend on, uh, on things which we'd now find uh, very uh, uncomfortable indeed. I mean, yeah, if you were to be in a sort of a working men's club in the 60s or 70s and you were homosexual, for example, there'd probably be moments where you'd be feeling extremely difficult, uh, uh, awkward indeed. Similarly, if you were sort of like an ethnic, ethnic minority, I think there is a lot of uh, humour which, you know, perhaps more than we might like to acknowledge, is based upon... Um, you know, identifying uh, the outsider groups and, and laughing at, at their expense. And, you know, so I think it's, 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 it, you know, it's nothing inherently sort of light or inclusive or friendly about comedy. It can, can be very vicious. And I think, I think it's something about the best philosophy. Uh, sorry, it's probably best philosophy and the best comedy. Um, has that knack of you know, doing both. You, you must make you sort of like feel a bit uncomfortable yourself. I think Alan Partridge, now I don't know, Alan Partridge probably isn't big in the States, he's a very, very British character, um, but he's, he's this comedy character and he's this grotesque man in lots of ways, but the point about him is that he does, so many of his things are just quite normal bloke things, you might want to call them, you know, just that little bit, pushed that little bit too far, 
And much as you kind of recognise that he is a kind of quite horrible character, I, I defy anyone to sit through any kind of episode of the show or the film and not to, at least at some moments, recognise bits of themselves in him. And that's what kind of saves it from just being that kind of savage mockery of another person. And, and makes him a sympathetic more, character whatever. as well. It's, you still yeah. kind of feel sorry for him when he like loses his job, even though he did lose his job because he punched somebody in the face <laughs> with a partridge stuck on his hand. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You sometimes find yourself rooting for him. So, for example, he's a complete philistine. He's absolutely complete philistine. Doesn't understand yeah. anything intellectual at all. And yet, at the same time, most of us who sort of like, like to think we're not like that, there are always things, aren't there, where we think, yeah, but come on, that's just pretentious, that's just whatever. And, and you know, he sort of like allows that kind kind of you know, inner philistinism to sort of come out of it and you do find yourself thinking a lot of the time well yeah, maybe, maybe he's got a point out of that you know? it's definitely it's definitely good to uh, it, it, it really uh, comedy is is such a very nuanced network of uh, uh, of rhetoric uh it's really difficult to pin down uh the difference between uh, uh a, a joke that makes you cringe uh, and a joke that makes you laugh about the same subject, like what is it about the phrasing, or what it was it about the delivery, or what was it about the the jokes that made me react so much differently in one aspect and 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 so much differently in the other. Uh, I think so long as the joke is successful in causing laughter, um, then I think then the memory of the point of the joke is probably a lot more likely to stay with you. Uh, than if you were to be sort of offended by it. Uh, if you're offended by it, then you're just going mm -hmm. to sort of shut off the point of the joke. Uh, but if you if you laugh at it, then that's sort of just kind of inserted into your thoughts a little bit. At least that's just my sort of interpretation of it. Mm. Well, I, I'm I wouldn't know much from a position of experience because I I tend when I do stand up not to focus on. Uh, offending people. I like people to leave the show feeling better than they did when they came in, but hopefully a little bit clever as well. But I mean, yeah, I, I might tentatively uh, agree with you, but willing to change my mind if if people are um, people say otherwise. I mean, you can do both. You can be kind of a little bit offended by something and laugh at it as well. Doug Stanhope, who's an American comedian, is is master of that. He's brilliant, and and some of his stuff is quite socially and intellectually challenging. And you think, wow, you're right, but also. Ha, that's hilarious, but also, uh, that's disgusting. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. It is interesting because it's not an exact science. Um, it it's, tends to be vague, and there are some mysteries about comedy. Like one of the big mysteries is if you read a transcript of some of Eddie Izzard's earlier work, you'd be like, "What the hell's this? This doesn't make any sense. This isn't funny at all." And then when you watch him do it, it's hilarious, <laughs> and you it's difficult to explain why. So, it is a very it is a very fun pastime, and and there is a lot of good deep thoughts to be done with it so let's see we only have about uh, about three minutes left to go as far as just my got a, go. yeah just got the two minute warning from scotty oh oh dear so i guess we have to uh we have to start wrapping up um so i guess uh first thing is is to ask both of you if you have any sort of final thoughts about the past hour or uh any any sort of plugs that either one of you would like to do uh now <laughs> well, i'm happy to ask plug time. I'm happy to plug Julian's books for anybody who hasn't read them. Oh. People often ask me what's a good way of getting introduced to philosophy, and I would recommend either of the two ones that I have, um, which are The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten or Do They Think You're Stupid, which I read when I was 16, I think, and was a lot of fun. So I will plug his material because it's good. We'll, 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 we'll do some mutual plugging, but I think that's also the plug for... Um, actually, I, I, to tell, I, I don't know, you'll probably do this on the hour anyway, but uh, The Engineers Without Borders, this, this sounds like a, a great cause. Um, yeah. Could we try, perhaps use our last minute or so just to sort of remind ourselves what the uh, cause we're supporting here is? Uh, 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 that's a fantastic idea. Uh, Engineers Without Borders, uh, for anybody who is not familiar with their work, what they do is they go into, it, very similar to Doctors Without Borders, the people who go into places that are lacking of sufficient medical care. Uh, uh, Engineers Without Borders is very similar in the sense that it goes to places that are very destitute, that are, that are very in need of a variety of different services, such as uh, uh, clean water, uh, electricity, uh, all these different amenities that we in first world countries sort of take for granted. And the engineers without borders, what they do is they go out and they make sure that everybody has at least these basic amenities that can at least make it so that people are more comfortable 
living in the wise, living with the wise. That's seriously cool. Uh, this is yeah. definitely a very good cause to donate to, uh, and I think everybody will feel a lot better knowing that they helped support that cause. Yeah, and well, actually, when I go back to the thing about you know philosophy, its limits and its values, I think that when when you think about you know people who choose to do that kind of work and the people who choose to support it against those who don't, I, I I'd bet pretty much to that house, I think that. The difference is not that the people who do it have a better developed moral theory. You see what I mean? I think when it comes to fundamental uh, human goodness and kindness, uh, the, the moral philosophy can can sort of help you, perhaps you know, tidy up your thoughts so that you you don't you make fewer well-intentioned mistakes, perhaps. But fundamentally, whether people choose to sort of do good things for the benefit of others or not, I think is probably got virtually zero correlation with uh, how well developed their moral philosophical views are. So there you go, the limits of philosophy, but the value of what we're talking about philosophy for today. Mm -hmm. uh, well, all right then, fine. Uh, <laughs> don't have time. I'm out of time next year. Don't have time to that. <laughs> I want I want to talk about that, but we are out of time. All right, so I would like to thank both uh, Dr. Begitti uh, and uh, Philosophy Tube slash Ollie for uh, joining me for this hour. Very much awesome. appreciate both of you being here, especially uh, uh, Ollie for being here on such uh, notice. My, my uh, pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm flattered that you thought of me. <laughs> well, uh, so much. I guess that's the hour. The next hour is, let me double check to make sure that I have this correct. The next hour is going to be uh, Katie Steckles, who is going to be hosted by uh, Sarah and Martimer. So look forward to that for the next hour, and everybody have a great day. Bye.